Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the program. What up? We're back. Episode 6. Yeah, that's right. I added music. For you first timers, you can't even appreciate this because I used to just not have background music and it used to just be me. Now, it's me and Redman. But maybe I'm going to get sued. What are they going to take from me? My podcast mics? I don't even own these. These are Rusty's. He bought them. So thank you so much to Rusty for the podcast mics. Hope you guys are enjoying the tunes I just picked for the background. That idea actually wasn't mine. Hava from Solomon, who I barely know, hit me up and was like, Dude, you could use some background music. I thought about hitting up Zach Marvin, but then I got kind of lazy, maybe a little shy, and I stole this Redman instrumental. So hopefully you guys are down. If you're not, well, fuck it. I don't care. For this episode, I interview Brian McClatchy, the Canadian GOAT. That's an understatement. I don't even know what category to put Brian in. He was the underdog. He was the best dude who never made it. He was Big L, you know? Well, minus the fact he didn't get shot and die. And thank God he didn't, because the world sure could use more Bryans and less people burning down the Amazon rainforest. We could dive into this for a second. Whoever doing that, they need to chill. 20% of the world's oxygen comes from that, whether that's factual or not, doesn't really matter. The Amazon rainforest is clearly a very important ecosystem. This is coming from your friend Jody, who is the most uneducated person on ecosystems, but I am smart enough to know no one should fuck with the Amazon rainforest. Leave it alone. You need soybeans, cattle, figure somewhere else. Go to Winnipeg. There's tons of land there that's doing nothing. It sucks. Yeah, it's probably going to cost more to grow it all because you're in Winnipeg, but chop down some Winnipeg trees, it's like no one's going to care. You go to the Amazon rainforest, you're not only pissing off the people, you're pissing off billions of living things. I mean, some ants and some deer might die in Winnipeg, but the rainforest has got a lot going on and people need to leave it alone. That's my two cents on the Amazon rainforest. Back to Brian McClatchy being the biggest goat ever. I don't know what is in the water in Wakefield, but clearly him, E-Man, Adam Reggie, I mean, Belzil and Burns were living around that area. There's something in the water over there that just makes people turn into kind of goats. I mean, the guy was the best before MySpace. Let that sink in. This is snowboard.com era. If you don't know what that is, it was a snowboard community that was on the computer when everybody had dial-up. If you don't know what dial-up is, Google it, hear the noise that the dial-up would make when you pick up the phone. That shit's insane. It's like, I don't know, no one knows what it is. Till this day, it's a mystery what dial-up is, but that shit was crazy, it was slow, and that's when Brian blew up. Brian filmed a part called St. Louis. It's on Vimeo, Jared Owl made it. Go peep that, stop what you're doing, delete the podcast, throw your phone in a lake, because this shit's crazy. Brian filmed a part that to this day could be put out, and anyone would be like, that's a legit part with legit tricks with great style. Switchback nose press, back 50-50 a triple kink, cab 270 to regular, that shit wasn't really going on at that point, and Brian brought it all to the game and looked so dope. Brian Stee, sick. Brian's kits were sick. He was wearing that like JP, kind of Nate Bozung, Jeremy Jones sweatband over his head. And he was pulling it off. He had like the long hair, JP style. Actually, I have a photo of JP and Brian. When Brian was a kid, he went to camp and boom, got a photo with JP. I'm definitely going to share that. He had it going on. From growing up in Wakefield with E-Man since day one, they clearly knew what was up. Brian was riding for Mission 6 and Stepchild. Unfortunately, I feel like he never really got an opportunity to film a full part. And if he had, I'm sure we would have been playing Brian McClatchy, pro snowboarder. Thank you for being on the podcast, Brian. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Enjoy the episode. Hit me in the DMs with who you want to hear from. I mean, Hava hit me up. I don't really know the guy that well. And look, I added a song. So if you don't want this podcast to suck, it's up to you. Anyways, thanks for tuning in. Enjoy. 
What up, Brian? Thanks for having me, Jody. Yeah, you're this welcome. Great. How, what have you been up to lately? Um, I'll go back like the last three years or something. Yeah, dude, for, do whatever for for now. Um, because it's been a hard, it's been a super hard time of my life, and now I'm, and now I'm busting. I've busted through that. I moved to Gambier like three years ago. The island, a, an island in the house sound right beside Bowen Island. And uh, just living on a friend's property there. Nothing there. There's just a well and a driveway on the five acres. It's like literally in the middle of nowhere? Well, it's, it's close to everything, but there's no ferry to Gambier. There's no stores on Gambier. So it's pretty isolated. But it's like you, you can... How do you get there? You can see the sea to sky right there. Uh, water taxis. Water taxis. And there's two companies. One, one out of Horseshoe Bay, one out of Bowen. And uh, they'll drive you over there, twenty five bucks for for a ride over. And like, what's the vibe over there, at Gamby? Is it like really chill? Is it kind of like farm to table style? I'm imagining. Pretty chill. A lot of a lot of just summer homes. I think like a lot of wealthy Vancouver. Oh. Just go hang out in there in the summer. Nice. It's pretty broken up the island. Like there's basically looks like your hand. There's like. Four, ba- four big bays, three main ones on the south side of the island. So you can't connect by road. Like you can't drive from one side to the other. But people have vehicles, and it's just little subdivisions. And you stick to your subdivision. <laughs> Is there, like, different vibes? Is each one of the finger for, bays kind of, like, different? For like sure. Like, one of them is, sure like, living like, off the grid, and the, ne- and the farthest one is, yeah. like, rich people from Vancouver. Exactly, and the west side is more of a community. I want to say a couple hundred people probably live there, and they got power, postal service, and we're on the we're on the south east side, Furcom it's called, and that's like pretty new development, maybe sixty lots, all five acres, all just pretty much sold the three years ago when my friend bought. Oh, so you were actually living on one of your friend's properties? Yeah, and uh, living in my camper van over there still. Steve, Steve, we all know Steve. He's living there on the same property, building himself a cabin. Little Steve, that's yeah. like Sean Pettit's like childhood best friend. Yeah, Steve Barrens. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Who probably grew up just down the road here. Yeah, he did. He yeah. grew up in Whistler. I remember seeing him and Sean at the Circle all the time at the skate park. Mm-hmm. But uh, my hip, my hip went out like two years ago. What do you mean? So, your hip went out. So I've. So I was trying to set myself up to be there with money so I could build stuff and not work. Because working is like, I don't know, takes all your time up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, working does take all your time so, up. Went down to, went down to California and grew, grew weed for some friends of friends. Became friends with them, but went down there and grew some weed. Was three, that sick? Three summers ago. It was amazing. Like how big? Like huge or pretty small? Um... Well, I think we grew something like five or seven hundred pounds. Five or seven hundred pounds. Yeah. That's a lot of dope. A lot of dope. Were you baked while you were doing this, or do you not even smoke weed? Yeah, we were, we were, it was pretty 24-7. 24-7 baked. the weed for most people. How's the weed you grew? Are you happy with your product? Super, super happy. Those guys really know a lot. Like, their parents were doing it. This is right in Humboldt, Humboldt County, uh. If you'd know, like, Eureka or Garberville. Garberville's got some weed going on, everybody. Just, <laughs> just as you get in kind of to the Redwoods, going down the Oregon coast. You don't got to give everybody the into... directions, dude. You might get a hit on you. <laughs> yeah, no, I think everyone knows. Yeah, yeah for down, sure. Down there. But uh, any, anyways, they got a big community, dope community there. For And it's, like, second generation now. And uh, so... A lot of knowledge. They're they really, know what they they're really good at it. Funny enough, my cousin is uh, starting a weed venture in Vancouver with two of his buddies, and one of his buddies is like, uh, I guess you could. He's like a he has a PhD in cannabis, and he invented this like pH balancer. Yeah, I for, it's called the Think Tank, I think. Okay. Anyways, it's like this revolutionary kind of pH balancer, and it's it's for cannabis 
like all oh, marijuana and it's apparently just makes it grow faster, better product and stuff like that. So yeah. he's just venturing into it right now. And I got to say when he came over last and he was talking about all this stuff and the strains and everything like that, you have to do so much work if you want to get that stuff through health Canada. And of course he's telling me like people that people don't get, like when you're buying weed off of Bob, who's growing it in his backyard with all these chemicals or miracle grow or whatever like that, they don't, tests for mold content and stuff like that and they don't clean the plants enough or trim them enough or whatever and he's like the product that is actually out through health canada is some of the best cannabis out i don't know would you agree Uh, will you agree people like the guy you're working for that knows all this stuff like obviously the weed he's growing and the weed you're trimming is probably way better than bob from pemberton (laughs) perhaps yeah yeah these these guys were like chemical free all organic and everything. Oh, nice. Um, and were they selling um, to like a, a distributor or anything like that? Or is it no, just like kind of under the table style? They would sell mainly to in bulk to people from other states, more east. Okay. And they would come over by 100, 200 pounds at a time and drive it back. To oh, the nice. Other. And the, so those guys were... were crushing the market the best the guys that could afford to drive to drive over and buy bulk weed from from the people in Humboldt and drive it back to the other states where the price is still high that's that's uh that's funny you mentioned that I got some friends back home in in Winnipeg they were doing the same thing with weed growing it in Winnipeg and then driving it to Calgary and for whatever reason some numbers got thrown around and they were saying that they were give the driver 10k to drive from each way to drive from Winnipeg to Calgary. So 20 grand. I mean, like, I don't know how many pounds they were driving across, maybe not a hundred pounds, but whatever they were delivering. I was like, one of my buddies was like 10 grand shit. Like, and he's a pretty straight edge guy. doesn't even smoke dope, you know, CFO kind of guy. And he, he was like, I need to do this on the side. Like I go to Calgary all the time. (laughs) Uh, yeah, pretty big business. Amazingly big business. So you finished growing all this weed down there? Oh, yeah, that's where I was getting Do you at. want to stay down there? Like, Or were you happy down there? I, lo- I loved it down there. So we we did the six months, right? Because we're allowed six months there as Canadians in the States. Before you got to like get a visa or whatever. Green card or whatever. Green card. So six months is up. And then we, me and another guy who I grew up with um, in Quebec and Wakefield, that's who introduced me to these guys, and so I was working with him. So I went a bit early and started things, and then he kind of stayed later. So we had a bit more than six months between the two of us. Tie up all the loose ends. <laughs> <laughs> so we could talk about California forever. It was amazing down there. But Did you get... skate a lot down there? No, just once. It was work every day, all day. It was fucking hard. So did you come it was back hard, with really some hard work. decent cash saved up then? Yeah. Yeah, they were paying us a percentage, so we got we each got fifteen percent of the the sales or whatever at the end of the year. Oh, way to go! And then that's a so no-brainer, get, especially with the boom of the whole cannabis industry now that it's finally not like this, yeah. uh, on par with like meth and coke, and people are finally realizing that cannabis actually has a lot of health benefits and it actually isn't even bad for you. Yeah. <laughs> and then so I get so I get back to Gambier with my plan. Uh, I never make a plan in life. Like, I never make a long-term plan. And this time I did, I was like, I'm going to go work. I'm going to make the money. I'm going to come back here, and then I'm going to build a home for myself or whatever on this property. And I got back, and within two weeks, I was in, like, chronic pain. All, all of my my back and my right side leg and hip, all the way into my ankle was, like, spasmy and... And all the muscles were tight and didn't, couldn't figure it out. So I'm on Gambier and I got the dog. I got my Tico. So traveling back to the city to try and see specialists and stuff. Back to Vancouver is a nightmare. Like no public transit because I got the dog. I can barely fucking walk. Like couldn't wasn't sleeping because I was just in so much pain. Yeah, so I couldn't figure it out. It was too hard. So I went back to Quebec to stay with my family. Got like an MRI and everything, and then figured it was a rip in the labrum and all kinds of other issues, like top of the femur was all decayed. 
the ball, the ball where it goes in was decayed, and then like, build how up, would that have happened? Build up on the bone. It could have been um, there my whole life. Could have been like it's probably genetics. My, oh, okay. my receiver to my top, my femur. I didn't know if you were drinking like four liters of Coca Cola a day and know. eating Wendy's every day, and it was like yeah. due to diet and health, or if it was from just genetics or just, something. Just genetics and wear and tear with skateboarding, snowboarding, and then probably working the six months every day, all day was probably pretty hard on it. And then, yeah, the muscles just were like, that's enough. There was cysts growing in there and everything. Oh, so you had to go home, go back to living with the parents because this pain is like, you're on an island. You're so secluded. Yeah, and I... Did you bring the dog? Yeah, bring the dog. I'd never been so... uh, like I'd never been exposed to chronic pain before. And yeah, you're just probably so debilitated. Super debilitated and super like, like you're my. I didn't trust my judgment. All of a sudden, I realized I'm like the decisions I was making were like so so far off to the point where I was like, oh, I cannot even trust my own decisions anymore. Oh wow, you are in your head hard. Like it was totally fucked me up, and then. Uh, yeah, so I went home. I had a surgery in the spring. Came back out last. Did the surgery go good? Came back out last. Yeah, it went good. Fuck yeah. So you're uh, feeling better now? Better now. It was a long recovery because I didn't keep up with my physio and stuff and my rehab just for a little bit. And then once I was able to like garden and walk and everything, I could just put off, push off the physio, you know? Oh, wow. That so it sounds... took, it was a long process. Like I'm still not 100% now, but. I can skateboard again, and I so can go to festivals So your master again. plan, the first time in your life that you ever made a plan, you're like, I'm going to save this cash, I'm going to move to Gambier Island, I'm going to build a house, I got my dog, like, Brian, you're doing this, this insane burden gets put on you that you had no idea that was even there, and then it just totally x those plans. <laughs> totally x the plans, and it was like... seemed like such a good plan, and it all worked out to this point so well, and then I was... You know, you're like, everything happens for a reason. So, big, strong believer of that. Me too. But this, I was like, why? What is it? What is it? How is this helping me, you know? Now I now I see that it did. It was serving a purpose. What do you think it served? Um, kept me from going too deep into this property, which isn't mine. And I say a friend, but it's like, a really good friend's ex partner. Now they've split up, and it's his, and it's his property. And I'm going, oh, actually, Britt, his ex partner, she's my good friend, not him. So I'm going, oh, okay, you know, kind of like glad you didn't build a house on someone's property yeah, that you don't so, even. So I'm not too deep in it. And I'm with. going, oh, okay, but. Um, so did you go, like you saved this bankroll, did it eat you alive to do this whole process? Or? Exactly. And then I, I was able to, to not work for, you know, over a year to oh. deal with the injury. That, I, well, I, so that was like, okay, thank God. Like that was nice that I could like go see specialists and work, work all that money out to them. But I was like, oh, like, at least I can afford it and it's my body. So that's fine. Yeah. So then I'm on, so now I'm on Gambier. Recovery. So you're still on that island? Or are you on the same property? Yeah, though? still on the same property now. But you just don't have plans of building there anymore. Um, not the same. Not in the same way. Like Steve's there. Steve's building a cabin. Another on friend. his own property? No, on the same property. Oh, okay. So he's yeah. is he winging it? Do you think? Because that seems like building a property on someone else's property could get kind of yeah. It's get once it comes down to like oh we built we put all this equity into it now it's worth more and then they want to sell the property. There's, there's definitely, yeah, it's going to be complicated if you're sharing, sharing properties. With I someone. think you dodged and the bullet there. And like, yeah, we're just living there. We're not actually like co-owners with him or anything, you know? Well, that kind of brings me to like, you're snowboarding. Eric Green did an incredible interview with King Snow not too long ago, a few years back. And he says that you're just not someone who really has a plan. You're just kind of like, like you kind of, it seemed to me almost that you fell into pro snowboarding, not like you had this goal where like someone like me, I was like going to move to Whistler and I wasn't trying to be a pro, but it happened. And then I, when it was happening, I realized the whole time I was trying for it. Yeah. Or at you, you, you were so talented 
and so ahead of your time you turned pro and it almost didn't even seem like you were like sweet i did it you were like yeah cool like what's next because like bef- as soon as i moved to whistler you have all this clout you're like the sickest snowboarder i have ever met i was the biggest fan growing up in winnipeg i come here and then before <laughs> i know it you don't even say goodbye there's no like did you hear brian's le-? you're just gone like just didn't tell yeah. anybody like you just disappeared and like at the peak of like I would say you're, you know, you had a part in uh, child support and then in the bonus of promo copy. I mean, right you, what you were the, doing was right groundbreaking. The flipping point to go one way or the other kind of thing. Growing up, because you, you grew up in Wakefield. Did you grow up with yeah. E-Man? Yeah, we grew up in Wakefield with E-Man. Um, mo- like most of those guys I went to, or half of us went to English elementary, half of us went to French elementary. And so, yeah, we had, there was kind of two elementaries, two high schools that the mix of us went to. And there was maybe like seven. E-Man tight. went to the French one, I'm assuming. Yeah. You were at the English one? I went French in primary and then, uh, and then switched over to English in high school. We knew each other. Like our brothers were always friends. He's got two older brothers and a younger, and I've got two older brothers. That we're all in the same kind of group. Yeah. And then, um, Did the yeah. whole crew of you guys snowboard, or was that kind of yeah, just was, like where you... There's maybe like seven of us that skateboarded, I believe. E-Man, his brother Lalak, Liam Hale, Adam Reggie, who you'd know. Oh, Adam Reggie's the sickest skater. Matt McNeely, you might know he lived here for a yeah, bit. Yeah, I remember him. We weren't super tight. Like Adam, I was in elementary with. Adam got screwed in elementary. We were like a bunch of English kids in grade one. And for some reason, they only held Adam back. We failed him on a grade one and put all the English kids in grade two in a class together, like 15 of us or something in a separate group together. Like it was... How do you fail grade one? The school, That's like the harshest the school, thing ever. Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, you, you fail. We're going to set you back from all your friends you just made over the last two years, kindergarten, grade one. Because you're not good at putting one and one together, it's like who gives a shit? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, we, I never understood it. Like, uh, it was kind of a racist school at the time. English to French, Masham and Wakefield are two small communities. One's English, one's French. Exactly. And now I believe it's fine. Now it's totally fine. Like my nephew went to that same elementary. But before was, there was like he was fine. Now. Like, a lot of animosity between the two. Yeah, even the teachers towards us. It was like Eman's always mentioned to me that it was like pretty, pretty rough growing up, like a lot of fights and stuff like that. Yeah, and he their high school was much bigger than ours. We had a pretty small English high school, and they had like an international, big school. So a lot more. So shit, what would your local mountain be with Eman? Like, what did you guys ride? Ski Vorlage. Ski Vorlage. Yeah. I've never heard of it. Yeah, we can remember there was no snowboarding allowed, at one point there. It, what? Like when did you guys start snowboarding? Like ninety. We were we were, I think it was eleven. Grade eleven. No, eleven years old. Oh yeah, that's. I decent. and I went. We went. Me and my brothers went to Mont Cascade. There's around the Ottawa area. We we're just half hour north of Ottawa. There's like, four or five little ski hills within like twenty minutes. So we went over to Cascade. Me and my brothers one year. Rented snowboards, you know, hooked our edge and hit our heads. Came home with some sore wrists and some sore knees. Yeah, but loved it for some reason. And then my mom got us, I think she got me and Robert, my brother, a snowboard to share. What did, What was your first board? A Rossi, like black and red Rossi. Kind of like red, red, red just up and down the middle and like a big oval. I don't remember it. Like super cheap looking, like oh, just yeah. black bottom, you know, like no. Everybody's first deck. Yeah, we started snowboarding the first year that they, and then they allowed it at Borlaug, so we started snowboarding there. And I remember there was Tom Mason, and he was, he was good somehow. I forget where he learned. He's older. He's probably almost 10 years older than us, you know. But he was sick. Yeah, and he was a carver. Like he would do it all, but he would carve down the hill full on. Like if I can Olympian was him and J C J Anderson buds, because E Man's yeah. cousin's an Olympian, yeah. J C J Anderson, and he he's hasn't he, he won two gold medals? Um, I think one, one, one for sure. One for sure. One for sure. E Man hold held the gold medal and everything, but he see J C J is like um, what's it called? 
not eastern townships, but they're like down by like Mont Tremblant, oh, okay. which is two hours from us. So I don't think he, I don't think him and Tom Mason were together hanging. And out would you guys have ever gone to Mont Tremblant or like? Because I knew Matt Belzil grew up in the same kind of area as you guys. Yeah. Did you ever see him around when you were kids? Uh, or Andrew Burns? I can't remember Matt Belzil, but I remember Andrew Burns from one of we had these snow jam competitions. Like make a big air or whatever, and and have a little snowboard contest, and I remember Andrew Burns at those, and he was so good back then. I remember seven, you know, seven twenties switch backside seven twenties, off these jumps when we're just like that must have been like two thousand. We're trying to do a front three, or maybe earlier. Earlier, it'd be like ninety five. Ninety actually, I have a switch back seven. Andrew Burns. Like it was, it was crazy. Switchback seven, and then Andrew Burns had all these fucking tricks, and then you see why he's, you're like, oh yeah, he's been talented the whole time, you know. Or Adam Chunts, the first guy on Stepchild, first ad of anyway. Jo- Johnny Fats. <laughs> Johnny Fats. I remember yeah. him from the contest, and I remember looking up to Johnny Fats and being so intimidated, like he would know everyone, and he'd be on the mic, like kind of like. Broing down in the scene. Broing down in the scene mid-contest, and you're like, whoa, super intimidated. I always remembered that. But. Did you ride handrails and film like a sh- any street stuff before you moved to Whistler? We tried. We would try and set up ham- handrails with... Um, and when you say with, try, with, would that mean try and fail? or did rink, you? <laughs> well, I guess I mean with like rink snow. Yeah, yeah, like, arena snow. Those were, we that were, was big back then. I feel like we wouldn't go in the winter. Like we would just ride the mountain in the winter and then... On the off season, we started would get into it. That would make sense. Even like I feel like that stuck with you for a while. That fifty fifty on that kink in uh, in Vancouver there that you just yeah. slam into the fence after yeah. that like iconic photo by Crispin. I mm-hmm. think that was in what that wasn't an Arcor movie, right? Uh, yeah, I think it was an Arcor movie. Yeah, that that was insane. and yeah, same thing. Arena snow, it's just like Help slush and run. Help was on some... the way, maybe. Yeah, that was arena stuff too. Yeah, just for the. It stuck with 24, you for a while. 24, 36, whatever, that photo contest. Like 24, or 24, 24 hours hour to get 36, and you have 36, not, yeah, maybe photos. Anyways. Like, were you and E-Man this whole time buds and riding together? Like, were you tight back then, or were you, did you just know him? We just, I just knew him. And then they would have skateboarded already in, the, in Wakefield behind a corner store, Joby's. And they had, like, boxes and ramps and stuff. That sounds like a good vibe. And, and they were there all, like, hardcore skaters, like, there all day, every day, all summer. Whereas I was probably, like, canoe tripping with my families in the summer, probably. We were do- grew up doing that. Snowboarding at the ski hill in the winter, like, my brothers were in the Nancy Green program and racers and everything. So I'd just, like, be at the ski hill all the time. And then we fell into snowboarding. And then we all met each other. Because of snowboarding. When, yeah, whether people were still skiing or some or some people were snowboarding. Then I started hanging out with them at the hill. For me growing up, I didn't know a lot about snowboarding and snowboard videos and the community of snowboarding and whatever. Did you did you follow the mags? Did you have a few favorite pros? Were you watching like Tech Diff and true life and stuff or did you were you like as clueless as i was my first few years or did you kind of have like an older dude being like the older cousin being like you should watch this video yeah first few years pretty clueless at least the first year pretty clueless once we started hanging out on the hill then they were like we skateboard all summer you should get you should come and then that's and then that was the end of it like then we were we were all together all the time so, cause, yeah, I did just that. Got a skateboard, went down to the Jovi's corner store, and E-Man's brother threw a, threw a pop bottle in the middle of the road, I remember, because they're all hitting the grind boxes and stuff. And he just threw a pop bottle on the ground. was like, just fucking ollie that all day until you get it. And that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> that was my intro to skateboarding. Ollie the pop bottle. <coughs> Mine was, uh, I had the same thing. I had an older friend be like, knew I was clueless and he said come to the skate park there's like some tricks you could do and I was so intimidated to go and he just said ride and then lift your nose and smack it into a box and then pick up your nose and then right away switch and just do that and you'll get the hang of just like and I I remember the first time I went up did like this nose doll in the box I was like 
kind of probably the same vibe you got from ollieing the pop bottle in front of all your boys. You're like, fucking right, it's yeah, the pop yeah. bottle, what's next? <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of hours in behind that corner store. We had, it, was, it was years and years before we had a skate park. And we then never it, had one either. And then it was, it was just like they, they put asphalt down in the outdoor hockey rink. That's exactly, well, okay, sorry. We grew up, like, our Jovies, am I saying that right, Jovies? Yeah. Our Jovies was a tennis court, and everybody brought boxes and rails, and then the the two people in our town of 2000 complained and were like, we want the tennis courts for tennis. And we're like, no one plays tennis in this town. But then, sure enough, the next year, they did uh, they paved the entire hockey rink, and then, of course, the small hockey community was like, we want to play street hockey on this. Yeah. But then we kind of just, like, made the skate park vibe a little bit too intense i think for the hockey people to come yeah. by maybe there's still, there's still and then there's still ball hockey to this day on the ring they took they they took the asphalt away and put concrete now because we got a proper skate park we won the craft contest where you like crafts was like giving out money to one town in every every province and Wakefield won it. Wakefield's like a town of like 2,000. You won a craft, like craft KD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The mac and cheese. Yeah. And they, you won a contest. They funded the skate park in Wakefield. Shout outs KD. And then yeah, we've, got a, we've got a really, it's small, but it's really well made and it's nice concrete. You know, it's a t- tiny little park, but a modern park, like new and nice concrete and the professionals made it. I forget. I'm forgetting which company made it out of the couple that we Skate had. Skate line? I forget. And then, uh, but then the rink is also paved, and it's the best flat ground I've ever seen of any park. Wow. And there's still, like, our rails and our boxes from back in the day in there. Would you say you got better at skating when you moved to Whistler? Cause yeah. Because I feel yeah. like you're, you're, I mean, you're really good at skating. Like, we were, I feel like I've seen you do, like, switch front smiths. Like, who does that? We were really bad at skateboarding. For how much time we put into it, actually. Adam was Adam was always a little bit better. He got it a little bit better. Adam looks like Tom Penny. But now he's like insane. It's insane how good he is now. But who was your things. favorite skater growing up? Like or a pro few. skater? Yeah, anyone. Like um, who's a handful? We were like the zero toy machine videos. Okay, like Ed what, Templeton. Um, Welcome to Hell. Oh yeah. Like that's... Welcome to Hell is what we watched. Over and over and over, and then like the shorties fulfill a dream, and then eventually, you know, misled youth came out. And where Belzil's from, like, there's skaters from Elmer, bigger town, a lot more of them. They would watch like Mouse and the girls, yeah. or the girls and the chocolate and all that. So our skating was like pretty limited, and we didn't have anyone that was better than us there. Oh, that's almost cool. never. Once in a while, a guy, Troy, would come, and he had, like, a few tricks, like, pop up nose off the launch, so we'd all pick that up. We're like, sweet. <laughs> we all picked it up. That's one of my tricks. Like, yeah, it's like, we you need, to, you need to see insane. someone do it, and then it just clicks in your head that, oh, that's possible. He did it so easily. I'm going to do it. See, we yeah. had the one guy in town that was, like, better than everybody, and I just could never, I tried so hard to achieve his level of, like he could hard flip over like four decks, like just in like tricks. Like I feel like I'm not even making this up. But when I was skating with him when I was growing up, I remember being like, "This is mind blowing how talented you are." Uh, he hit the bottle for a long time, so hopefully he's off. Interesting how often the talented and the drugs and alcohol it goes hand in hand. Any young, young, young kid, and you get that much respect in your little community. It seems like. The cool thing to do is to pick up cigarettes. The cool thing to do is to have a six pack of beer. The cool thing to do is to have weed, listen to rap music and be hanging out with the older crew. And then all the young people or the same people that are your age are like mesmerized by what you're doing. I remember every one of my favorite skaters or favorite snowboarders in Winnipeg were doing that stuff. And a lot of them have, I feel bad saying this, but like that has led them to like potentially like not a lot. If you're a young kid, Know not to get into substances that you can't handle too early because your brain's still developing. you got to chill. That's right, yeah. And even just the pressure, I think, of being a celebrity or in the spotlight. It's like 
too hard for a lot of people. Like actors in Hollywood, same totally. thing. Like just too much fame, too much money when they're too young and they I've snap. heard George Clooney say like these actors today are getting so much fame so quickly. You know, they'll put a TV show and they'll be like, boom, the next biggest celebrity in the tabloids and they have millions of followers. And it's like the amount of those people that are just going to rehab that get absolutely, you know, that they're a one hit wonder because of the substance problem that comes along with being a zero to the biggest thing ever. Yeah. But I mean, it is what it is. So, but, but back to it. when did you move to Whistler? Did you move here at you, Adam, Reggie and E-Man? Did you guys move out here together? Were you the first? I was the first. My mom sent me to uh, Dave Murray Whistler summer snowboard camp. <laughs> nice. And two for two summers. So probably when I was, 15, 16, or yeah, probably 15, 16. And then the summer I was 17, I would have worked at the summer camp my parents were involved in, in Tobogamy in Ontario. And then I would have moved out west after that, I believe. Was anybody notable at the camp? Like, was there anybody cruising around? You're like, what? There's Wes Makepeace. You're like, what? There's J.P. Walker. I yeah, think. yeah, for sure. For sure, there was. There was all the pros up there to me. It was like, yeah, J.P. Walker, Jeremy Jones. I snapped a photo with them. <laughs> I snapped a photo with Mike Michaelchuk, and I still have these. Eh? It's priceless. You have them still? Yeah, me, oh. me, arm in arm with J.P. Yo, we like, need to get these I'm photos like for the 15. podcast release. And then uh, I was just just remembering one because you see Michael Chuck around. He's still in the community. Oh here. yeah, and. Uh, he was at base coast and it was just made me made me realize i was like fuck dude i've got a picture of you of 20 you. years I'm just ago. like a little kid you know and they seem like adults but yeah that was a really cool experience and so that's that's i knew oh i want to move here i want to move to whistler actually when i skied when i was still skiing so i, w- I was like 12 or younger 11 or younger i remember thinking I'm quitting school when I'm 15 and I'm moving to Whistler to ski race or to like do, mo- sorry, not ski race, but like do moguls. I was always more a bit in the freestyle. See? <laughs> and that was my plan. And then I started snowboarding. A couple years went by. Okay, finish high school. That's smart. And But then I still moved to Whistler to snowboard. It's always been in the back of your head that you want yeah. to move west and just... Yeah, so you were work. asking if that was like my plan and it was. Because I remember telling my some of my teachers... What are you what are you gonna do, Brian? I'm gonna go be a pro snowboarder in Whistler. And they were like, You can't do that. It's not a legit like career. I said, No, I'm doing that. And then you did. You yeah. turned into a pro snowboarder. Yeah, was I pro? I don't even know. Uh, what? What do you mean? For sure. Okay. It's tough for me to think, even if you never achieved pro, I mean I'll say it. I'm I'm not at a professional level. Like I'm a I've been snowboarding long enough now that I feel like I can I, I know the talent I had seen. Like you were one yeah. of the best snowboarders to ever exist in rail riding and like in park and like skill wise, like my, you could have done anything you ever wanted to. And you did the one, there's one part that you obviously you didn't put it out, but stepchild released on their website. And this was like dot com when it just came out. And you, I went to stepchild. Simone just signed with them and they put a Brian McClatchy full part out and you like back 50, that triple kink. Yeah. Like just, is it the C. Louis part? Maybe. Jared, I was at it. Yeah, it was like you could have been in the top three rail parts of that year. Like it was just mind melting and how... Yeah, it was, it was really good. We had like, everything just worked well, you know? You had, we did top of, I think we did top of the world trips to like Ottawa. And there was, Ottawa often has good snow in the hall. So we'd go back there. We all had our parent like we were all grew up there, like Burns, Belleville. We all had like a home base there. We had the top of the world band. They had a camera for us. And uh, so we'd just cruise around hitting rails. And it was like, you're just racking up shots. And Oh, you you are. I mean, I remember my first time trying to film. I was just doing lip slides to tanks and tacoing. And everyone's like, why did we bring this? Like with Dwayne Weave, they're like, why did we bring this quiet guy? (laughs) Like, this guy's crazy. (laughs) Yeah. And I forget. forget. Oh, we went to Poland. With you, Phil Thomas. Yeah. I remember Um, that trip. Dave Rulo. Dave Rulo, Aaron Shapiro. Um, that was all in Aaron Northport Leland too. is the filmer. Aaron Leland. Yeah, right? Leland. Yeah. yeah. Leland. Regis Demekar. And then who is the photographer? Oh, uh, Sean Hughes. So it was a really cool crew. Phil Thomas organized the whole thing. He was just 
I think like snowboard.coming, these kids in Poland, and then they were like sending him photos of rails. And it was like, no fucking way. Like they were sending us nice shots of nice spots. And they were like, come on over. You guys can stay with us and we'll take you around. You can hit the rails. Yeah, and so no, like, no security, no cops, really. Like, it was all good. We got kicked out of a few spots by, like, by, like, the hooligans, like, the soccer hooligans, basically, would come out. And luckily, we were with locals that would be like, everybody get in the fucking van right now. We got to go. Like, we do not want to be here anymore. Like, one of their friends got axed before we had got there, like. Axed? Like, with an axe? Like, they were snowboarding on a rail and. Some boys came out and robbed them and fucking hit the one guy with the axe a couple times in the body. He lived. <laughs> what? He lived, but it was like... He literally got axed. I was, was like, I yeah. thought that was like a slick term for like getting jumped. No, literally. With like a hatchet. Yeah, if you're going to Poland, watch out for people. You might get axed. But the real world over there, right? It's not America. Yeah. They, they're, they've been through some shit recently, so... Oh, know, yeah. They're fired up. I mean, World War Two hit them pretty hard. Yeah, and that was the Poland trip, and I always wished I'd gone back. I, I still want to go back and find those guys and say say what up. Plastovich. Yeah. That'd be dope. He was the, kind of the crew leader, I guess, at the time of those guys. And so when did you get sponsored, and how did that happen? Did you send out a demo tape, old school style? Did you get noticed when you were in Ottawa and kind of hanging out in Quebec, or did you get through, noticed when uh, you moved to Whistler? Through my mentor, Graydon. Graydon? Yeah. Yeah. He, uh... Graydon Kavanaugh. Yeah. Am I saying that right? Kavanaugh? Kavanaugh, yeah. Kavanaugh? Yeah. Or Kavanaugh? No. Nah. Kavanaugh. Yeah. Graydon Kavanaugh. He's, like, the goat before you. Like, yeah, so, I remember being, like, oh, E-Man and Brian are, like, the yeah, best. Yeah. No, and, and Belzil, like, the, and Burns. Like, that crew from East is the sickest. And then when I met all you guys, you're all, no, Graydon's the sickest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, when I first moved here, I moved into staff housing. Got a job with a snowboard school and Domino's Pizza. But snowboard school. That is school. the most class lineup you could have. Move to Whistler, staff housing, snowboard school, Domino's Pizza. Yeah. Everyone first, worked at Domino's. First year in Whistler, I was making pizzas at Domino's. That was it, just for the, for the first winter. Last year in winter, delivery driver, Domino's Pizza. So stoked. Did you Amazing. ever work with Rube Goldberg? Yeah. Y- yes, yeah. Rube yeah, so always gets mentioned on the podcast because he's my boss and he's he's the he's the fl- he's the mm-hmm. gist. And I would have uh, met a lot of snowboard connections there. Mike Hart, Rube Goldberg, um, sober Steve from like the Mayhem videos. Okay. So he was like the manager, one of the managers there. So it was just like, yeah, you're just kind of like thrown into this world. Like Mike Hart and Rube are like sledding and actually like filming parts and like. They're probably professionals almost already then, I think. So what would have been yeah, your first then, sponsor then? Was it Mission 6? No, it was Stepchild. Stepchild was your yeah. first. Damn. So, so I worked snowboard school with Mike Doyle, and he lived at the dirt. He's from, he's from Newfoundland to Nova Scotia, met grade in Nova Scotia, and they, they basically moved out here together, I think, Mike Doyle and Graydon. So I worked snowboard school with Mike Doyle, Rode with them in the park a couple times, and then they're like, hey, you should move into the dirt with us. It's just like 666 Cedar Grove Lane down in the Whistler K. The house is torn down now, and there's a new one, but it was a snowboard house for years and years. Rube, Rube moved into that house after us, actually. It became their snowboard house after we were there. But uh, So I moved, so I didn't really know Grant. I've mean, seen him at the park a couple times with Doyle. And was he pretty talented then? Did yeah, he was talented, and he had this, that inner, that rock star energy, always from the get go. Like you're like, fuck, dude, look at that guy, and like, he's just fucking not waiting to watch anyone. He doesn't care if anyone's watching him. He's just hitting the jump, and he's got good style naturally somehow. And when that wasn't even a thing, you know, just like a Devin Walsh, like they just got it. They're just good and styly and cool about it, but. So yeah, move move in with the dirt with them. I'm guessing Graydon was probably like, "What the fuck are you doing, making getting this fucking 
snowboard school guy moving in our house, you know, probably. Like, he's probably like... He probably thought you were down. a little bit of a kook. Probably. <laughs> I think it was... I think I remember the day we had a dirt rail. It was one of the Camp and Champs rails. There were flat bars and they were yellow, like 15 feet long. There was a couple of them around the village that probably got stolen from Lot 8 in the off season. And then they would just, like, be at snowboard ski houses in the backyards. And we had one of them for years. And we took it around the sand pits and stuff, and we'd set up like a handrail and things like that. I remember that one edit of uh, of E Man riding in the backyard mm-hmm. on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And doing like four hundred tricks on it. Yeah, exactly that rail. And then that's why you guys are all so good at rails. Yeah, you know, two seventies must have been coming in. The the cab two seventy come out regular. Yeah. That was in, or that was a thing, but we didn't know how to do it, and we set the fucking rail up. I wanted to try it. I think I got it first try. I kept to send me back to regular on this little dirt rail. And I'm pretty sure Graydon was like, all right, this guy's got some talent. And he, sorry, he was, see, he was already on, he was already into the stepchild thing. This is like Sean Johnson's starting a company and there's no boards even made yet, but he's sourcing out a young rider. And through, through Trevor Andrews, Trevor dated Graydon's sister way back in the day in Nova Scotia. So he knew he knew the Trizza already. Graydon was friends with the Trizza. Yeah. And they they he he dated his sister, but he has like I think they were hanging out too all the time, even though he's a bit older. So through Sean Johnson to Trevor, oh here you gotta get this guy Graydon on on the crew because Graydon was good like he would ride with the Trizza and he could do Mick twists in the half fight they had a I think because Trevor was um he was a big name right away huge back way back in the day for it wouldn't have been Olympics yeah then but maybe just when he was like half pipe I'm pretty sure he's like half pipe prodigy and then everyone realized he's just really good at everything it was like Aaron Styles maybe in Europe he he won one or two of those so there was like Burton and the winnings from that was like huge so then everything just fucking went from there and then uh, so yeah he was he said he introduced Graydon to Sean Johnson and then Graydon was like and there's my roommate you gotta hook him up too. There's my roommate who's uh, working at Domino's and he's coaching right now. We gotta get him on Stepchild. I just saw him do a cab 270 first try. This guy's fresh. Yeah. And then that was it. Took his word for it. And then so would the original Stepchild team be you, Graydon, who else was on it? It would It would probably be, I mean, Graydon and I think even Sean Johnson was using his name. I think it was great in Sean Johnson. I remember there was ads in Skate Canada, skate, skateboard movies. But there was stepchild ads for snowboarding in there. And it'd be great in Sean Johnson. And then, and then I was just, I, would, I wouldn't, don't think Sean would have put, put me on the, the list or something at the time or anything. But yeah, so he had great in and he had me on a flow and. They were just sourcing out Simone. Simone was riding the glaciers, the Camp of Champs for some reason. I, maybe just as a camper, but he was like, styly, got all these rail tricks, and people were mind blown. Kevin Sloan, I think, was a big link between, between Simone and, uh, and Sean Johnson. Wow. So then, yeah, it would have been Graydon and Simone, I think, is the original. That's what I would say. And then, so you live with... When does E Man come into this picture? Like, does because he like I think of Stepchild when I moved here. Not to keep bringing E Man's up into freaking the Brian McClashy no, podcast, but you guys are like you guys are like brothers. Yeah. So when I moved to Whistler, like Stepchild is one of my favorite brands at that point because of you and Simone. I didn't know who Graydon was, call me clueless at that time, but it was just like Simone and Brian McClatchy. Like those, those are the dudes I'm into. Then Jeeves got on Stepchild because before DC was making um, boards, Jeeves filmed like this little part and he was just on DC, but he needed a board and Stepchild started set, giving him some boards. I didn't know that. Yeah, for a year when he was like 16. Then he moved to Whistler, got on Dino, and then he got onto DC boards after that. But he oh, was getting yeah. some free Stepchild boards for cool. like for a hot second. Yeah. So it was just like, 
Jeeves, you, Simone Chamberlain, like trio of my ultimate boarders yeah. are on this company. I come to Whistler and then I see this guy named E-Man riding with you. I got to say, well, the first time I ever met you, it was like, they always say, don't meet your, like, your heroes or pro. I remember meeting you at Moguls and I was like, this guy is even cooler like you were so nice and so like humble and you had your mission six stuff on. But then I see your little sidekick and it's E-Man and he's got like, he's got your leftover mission six stuff, maybe burns his stuff. And he's got a stepchild board. Cadence and I'm board. like, who's this little Brian? And then we go riding me and Jeeves and we're like, whoa, like those two dudes are the best. Like we just moved to Whistler, the Mecca of snowboarding and the two best dudes without a doubt are Brian and E-Man. Oh, and Logan Short. Between you three, it was just like, I, I was just every day riding with you three, I was just like, my head was getting exploded. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I'm trying to think when E-Man Did, have, So you, you probably apprenticed E-Man to Stepchild, there. like Graydon apprenticed you to get on Stepchild. Yeah. Apprentice, weird word. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Sean Johnson had a house in Squamish now, a mini ramp in the fucking, in the garage. And E-Man, E-Man was fucking, I probably impressed him with his skating. He was fucking killing it with the skating. And yeah, he was already riding like stepchild boards. Like our, our whole house, it would be like, everyone's on a stepchild board. I think like Graydon and Mike Doyle were on vans. So there's like vans shit, mission six shit. Oh, United Riders. Yeah. Remember United that? Riders. Yeah. I had a jacket. So there's tons of United Riders. So it was just like. You know, Graydon is just like, you're sponsoring this kid anyways. Look, he's dressed in all the gear. Just make it official, probably. But I can't, I can't quite remember if E-Man was moved two years after me or one year. He moved there in the summer. Yeah, he moved there in the summer. He was working for a legendary snowboarder helping build his house down the street. Brian Savard, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was going to say Sheen Campos. <laughs> no, Brian Savard. I think Sick. he helped, helped him build his house. I was like, that was his first job in Whistler, I believe. It's just like at the construction site down the street. Yeah, and we all learned to skate out here. We didn't have never skated training before. We couldn't drop in a quarter pipe or anything. So we, we our skating finally like excelled here because it was like people that were good and there was tranny and... Nice. And the the nice skate park here is pretty wavy, I would say. It was almost a good word. Like you could get, you have to go fast for everything. So it's easy to get speed wobbles. And then there's just like the concrete wasn't that smooth. Cause I remember coming mm -hmm. here for COC and skating, like what we were both saying, uh, like an asphalt paved skating rink and then coming here and like dropping in on the six foot and being like, whoa, this concrete's not perfect. <laughs> yeah. Like this shit is wavy. And I was just bailing everywhere. And I was like, I need to go back to Winnipeg <laughs> and skate my box. <laughs> yeah, I still got the love for a flat bar box. So yeah, yeah, I'm a box flat bar away. guy. That's what I grew up with. I'd I'd skate that anytime, and I'm terrible. And yeah, just the thing like we didn't have a skate park, so it'd be like flat ground was our thing. But our flat ground game is it was never any good. Like you what? know, it was never like we never had three flips dialed. I've never had a three flip dialed in my life. You know. No, like, 180 flips of any kind. It's weird. E-Man had a couple of flip tricks back in the day. And Adam, but... You guys are all really cook, good skating. Cook flip, that's about it. Still. I mean, like, you could throw into, like, the whole, like, doesn't matter what the trick is. Because I remember skating the Creekside Underground, and you guys would be there sessioning a box. I was like, whoa. Like, good trick selection. Like, you know, like, good fast crook really fast kick flip like red i'm i'm calling out some reggie tricks right now yeah, yeah. but like Reggie's dude fast, reggie looks legit. like tom penny he's just got like that flawless d he skates fast he's got high pop it's just like and then there's you i always thought you were pretty tech like i said switch front smith i, I don't know why whenever i think of brian skating i think of weird switch grind tricks yeah, that yeah. are like uncomprehendable to me yeah, and e-man's really it. good at skating i've so always loved skating switch it's like easier on my body i think balance out the snow do you I, do I one of those better weird... ollie like it sticks it's consistently sticks to my feet even though like bomb a hill like i'm for sure it's sketchy or go and switch but like the ollies and everything made sense and then one summer in whistler i rolled my front ankle my left ankle so i was forced to i could only ollie switch 
So it was a whole, an entire summer of skating switch at the Whistler Park, and that changed it, everything for me. That's insane. Yeah. I feel like so many people would be like, they go to the park, they're trying to ollie, their ankle would be rolled, and they'd be like, I'm done for the year. Yeah, You're was, a I wizard. Could, I could just... If you roll your ankle, ladies and gentlemen, and start skating switch. No yeah. excuses. <laughs> yeah, and then, uh, yeah, I'm, I, so I snowboard goofy, but I think every other thing I go regular. Skating... Even if I would, were to put my board on a, like if I were to do no boarding, I would go regular. See, I would just I would do everything regularly. And if I rolled my ankle, I wouldn't start skating switch. I'd probably just go home. So you come here, you get on Stepchild, all this magic starts happening. You meet Graydon, you meet Sean Johnson, you're on Stepchild. You probably don't remember, but I'm pretty sure you were on the pro team. And with Simone yeah, it was and, definitely listed on yeah, the protein. Um, sure. Yeah, like you, it was like you and Simone, whatever. Wh- what was the whole, like that stepchild movement was like something really sick to be a part of. So when you turn pro with that, you have this good footage coming out. What led you to be like, I'm just going to, astri- like I've accomplished all this and just disappeared. Did you stop like loving snowboarding? Do you feel like you just got burnt on it? Or because you were like one of the best. The right people know, especially in Canada. That's why, like, you're, like, super, like, Eric Green said in that King Snow article, like, total underground Canadian legend. And, I mean, if you were really following closely back then, you really got to, like, see those moments where people are like, whoa, that guy's so much better than people. Like, your bonus stuff and promo copy, how is that not in the video? I remember I had to wait to the end of the video, and then I was about to turn it off, and then it was, like, you and, like, a handful of other people, and you had, your clips were, you had, like, I think you had three clips, and they were all so sick. Benji, Tara Dikides. Yeah. yeah. Just crammed you guys in at the end. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think a, a, a big part of what turned me off was the image thing. And Sean Johnson, not to like badmouth him because he helped us out so much and everything, but I think he always was like, what's your image, dude? What's your image? You can't just be a guy in a t-shirt and jeans, but so I was kind of trying to like figure that out and I was like okay not good at like selling myself but I think I felt like I was like oh just let me do my thing like just let me be a fucking quiet dude if that's if that's what I am like I'm not gonna make up a fake image to go along with this snowboard thing and I think that really bugged me and turned me off it's kind of and it and it took a while for me to realize that because Sean Johnson's like, a, you look up to him or whatever, right? It seems like he knows exactly what's right and what's best, and he's done it all. But I think that that and the financial thing just turned me off. Like it was just like always put always putting my own money into like you put a lot of your own money into snowboarding, or I'm sure any to go like to go towards any professional sport or career like that you're gonna fucking grind out starving artist style you know for a while before it works but yeah it was just too hard and then there was like what Sean Johnson warned us about lots of broken promises in the industry and watch out and this and that and sure enough it was like like mission six was like got me and Bur- burns on there who else did, who else did they have on there a few i was riding for mission yeah. six i wasn't listed obviously on the team few i was of just us like canadians this. up here and they were like fucking with us a bit like it was just such a big company down there so they'd like be like oh yeah well you know we signed contracts for video and photo incentive and a little bit of travel budget and then we didn't see shit like never got any of that i was like I'm not into collecting all these magazines that we're in and video parts and mailing them down to you guys so you can see them so we can get paid. And then it was like, oh, it's changed the management or whatever. Uh, we can't pay you or this and that. And I was just like, what the fuck? Like, we've done so much for this company and you guys are going to fucking cut us out like that? I feel like snowboarding is the only sport where that's, and it, maybe in skateboarding or surfing or moto or whatever you want, like, I hate, this is another word I don't like saying is action sports, but like that community, I feel like because they're dealing with such young kids that they feel like they don't, they don't take anything serious. These kids don't know anything anyway. Like 
most likely they won't send that invoice anyway. Yeah. And it sucks that they make you work so hard. You're like an 18 year old kid living on a couch. You're eating the most, you're living the most gnarly lifestyle just to like do your, what you love. Yeah. And you're branding yourself with Mission 6 or whoever at the time so heavily. And then they give you this contract and it's like they dangle this carrot in front of you so you finally feel good and at the end of the year due to all these bullshit complications. They've, they only fulfill it by like 50%. And that other 50%, you can get it, but the amount of work you have to put in to get that money is absurd. They almost make it so annoying that you're like, you know what, keep your $2,000, I'll work for two weeks this summer, go fuck yourself. Yeah. And then like Stepchild, who was like a new company, you know, they're probably broke, broke ass as fuck. Like they're probably going in debt for this, trying to make it work, and they're like, Buying us plane tickets and paying for us to do this and that, you know, just with no contract, just, yeah, oh yeah, you guys for sure will give you some money, like carry, helping us out. And it was like, even Anna, like Brendan, Brendan Kavanaugh, like paid for me to go to Sweden to a contest, you know, and it was like, that's just like basically a homie putting 1500 bucks out of his own pocket for me to go. Was he a sponsor? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm with that Anum, like the clothing. What is it? Anum clothing. Anum. I don't remember that. Uh, uh, he's like he's from like Ottawa area too, and he just he just started a clothing company. I like Jesse Del Gross, I think. I remember Jesse. I want to say like Belzil and Regis were on there, and me. And uh, yeah, so you I was going. Why do these, like these tiny little companies, are helping us out? And these other huge guys are like lie, lying a bit to us and not helping us out. I was like, this is so twisted and weird. It's insane how they make it so difficult. And then a company that Alum or what was it called again? A- Anum. They're, they're, they're paying for your plane ticket. Or when Kareem Al Rafi had that company called Frontline, exactly. Frontline is paying for people's plane tickets. Frontline paid for E Man to go over and then. And I'm paid for me to go over. Yeah, like the two smallest homie companies dishing out like fifteen hundred dollar flights. Yeah, but and uh, but I also feel like we came in right at probably the worst time to make a career out of snowboarding. Like I feel like there was the era before us, like all the Frenchies coming out here, all these guys, the Wildcats guys, you know, the whiskey days. I'm not, I'm not, like, I don't know this for sure, but I feel like there was the ski companies or whatever were like, oh, or whoever is like, oh, there's a market here. The snowboard world is building. And they were just chucking money at them, right? Like paying for trips, paying for these guys to buy cars and go on trips and drive around the world with huge budgets. And they were just fucking partying and taking advantage too much of all these sponsors and stuff were like, oh, no, no, no. We can't be just ditching out money to these guys anymore. And it was all, all of a sudden, like, less money in the industry. And standards went skyrocketing through the roof at one point for, like, video parts and stuff. It was like everything had to be super legit. And, like, you know, you couldn't, like, do a front board and come out fakey or... You know what I mean? Drag your hand or you couldn't come off early. And the backcountry stuff too, you know. It all had to be so legit. Whereas like, it was like, not really like that again anymore. Like you can put more fun stuff in the video or more fuck around stuff. I or mean li- like, or little rails your video parts back, back then were on par though. Like that, those few years that you really filmed and like really were going for it were, if someone put out a part right now, that would those were all be legit shots in any part. And if some new kid put out the exact part that you had filmed twenty years ago or fifteen years ago, I'd be like, whoa, like yo, like I'd be hitting my team managers up, like, yo, Tom, we gotta get this kid on. This kid is onto some shit. And mm-hmm. then after those years, you would just film like a handful of clips, like child support years, dope years, etc. You'd just have like a few clips get leaked out mm-hmm. and Remember that switch hard way back to 70 or that fakie hard way back to 70 like that trick had just been invented in the park i remember el show was doing them jeeves was trying them 
E-Man. And then that same year... Learned it from E-Man. Yeah. You learned it from E-Man? Yeah. Well, he's, he, I saw him do it in the park first. We, could, we couldn't believe it. We could not believe that he figured this trick out. Because we started thinking about it, I think. Because maybe the fakie and Ollie backlip was a thing. Yeah, the fakie back to L270 came out yeah. hot that year. I, I want to say E-Man just thought of it and was like, yeah, we can do this fucking shit. Just pop, like he would pop so fakey style too, you know what I mean? Like so much more than anyone do now. And he started getting it in the park. Remember Re- him and Regis came back one day and Regis went, he fucking did it. He got, he got that trick. He can do it in the park now. And then went out and saw him do it. Was like, that's fucked. Simone, I remember Simone was saying, because he was traveling a lot more than us. So he was seeing like going to the States a lot more. And he said he's seen some one guy trying it in the states, um, in the park, at the same came, same kind of era as E Man was doing it. But jeez, uh, I'm just forgetting his name right now. Hayden Wrench, um, he filmed it. Dolly Cam set up at the top. Oh yeah, that yeah. clip was used to like for the teaser of one of the Sandbox movies, and I remember maybe seeing, one of the Frenchie movies too. I remember yeah. seeing it, like, cause back then, like. There wasn't a lot of snowboard content coming out, so when something would come out on the internet, it would be like really highly anticipated, like yeah, teasers yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And that teaser came out, and you did that, and I remember losing it and going into the park with Jeeves and everybody and being like, we need to find out if he did that. Like, did he actually make it all the way down? Like, did he land that? Because <laughs> no one had ever done it was that like trick. like second try, I think. Second? It, yeah, it just fucking, it just clicked. It was like we got we did the fakey backlip, that felt good, and then I tried it once and just kind of went over to the other side, probably one eighty, like fakey one eighty over the rail, didn't really hit it, and then I think if I could just locked in somehow and couldn't believe it and hit the kink, it felt so fucking good to hit the little kink of that salmon arm rail at the end, and you know didn't. Didn't have to like hold back. Like it wasn't trying to force me another 270 or something. I just kind of went and it all felt good. I was like, no way. Probably one of the most satisfying things. It was mind melting. Yeah. That must have been the year after child support. You filmed that clip. Like, how would that have just, translated I was getting into like tur- you I leaving? I was getting a lot. I was getting turned off a lot. Like, child support, I wasn't really in, and that bummed me out. I think that child support was the same year as that internet movie, the Sailor And I feel like it was like, I don't know if it was the quality of the filming or because it got released on the internet, but Johnson didn't want to use it again in the video. St. Louis, I don't remember that. St. Louis? It was like, that's Jared Owe's edit. I think that's the one we're oh, talking okay. about. Yeah. That he like put on the internet and Johnson didn't like that. Because then everyone saw the footage and Johnson wanted to keep it for the video. He's quite like that. And Jared's kind of like that too, though. It's like, probably yeah. it was like, this is my footy. I want to leak it of my homie. So I wasn't really in child support. That bummed me out. For and sure. Then, I remember watching child support and wondering why you weren't more involved in that project. And then we had a not so successful trip in Ottawa, which is another thing that bummed me out. We went to Ottawa again. The top of the world camera didn't record like the whole trip. So we were in Ottawa, killing handrails, putting everything on the line, and then it was just like a blank tape, like the camera stopped working and we had no idea. It was like fucked up already, like we did, we couldn't review stuff, so we didn't know. Lots of there was lots of good, really good stuff, and I remember being like, like devastated. So horrid. It's I couldn't so imagine hard. filming for an entire trip and then coming yeah, back like, and none of it worked. Exa- exactly. Like flying across the country, driving around, you know, doing everything. And then it was like nothing. It was like, our fucking camera doesn't work? Like, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I just kind of, I just kind of got turned off at one point, trying to keep it going and didn't want to get let down anymore. Didn't want to put more into it and not get anything back. Like, so yeah, I had a girlfriend at the time, Emma, and we moved to the city. Knew I would not. I'm not a city person, but I was like, okay, one year. And I don't know if I'd given up on snowboarding already at that point, or was that like mentally 
really tough for you or was it like an easy like you know what we didn't get that footage I don't want to be what my brands expect me or what they're expecting of me and like who they want me to be and I think it was pretty easy and then like there was more and more emailing and more and more organizing and like I was just not into emailing and shit that that stuff kind of like sets me off like that shit drives me nuts like if I got a if I got a phone in and stay on hold to the phone company or book a plane ticket and it goes fucking sour and I booked the wrong one by accident, like I've I've had a many a breakdowns over this stuff. Like on hold and my phone dies, like I'll just fall to the ground in the fetal position and be quivering and crying. You know, it's like <laughs> I cannot handle this sort of stuff. So it was just like more, more and more and more of that. It was like I couldn't, I couldn't handle that side of it. It was a lot. It's a lot more than just snowboarding. Yeah, it's like you know, if you want to be a like, there's so much more than what you think of as a kid. Like, oh, that's what I want to do. Go, go film and be in the videos and. Make I've it, had a lot of friends tell me it was like that the bigger they've gotten at snowboarding, the less they've snowboarded, and the more. You know, you have to go to a catalog shoot. Once you've done the catalog shoot, you got to go here and shake high fives. Then you got to go and take photos for the new colorway that's coming out. And then you got to go check samples. And then mm-hmm. and then they're like, "When did, I'm, I'm a snowboarder. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, pay me to snowboard. I mean, obviously, every once in a while, you're going to have to do stuff that you don't like love to do. But when it turns out to be a ratio that's like, you know, not really justifiable when you're what your actual passion is is to snowboard or skateboard and then you have to write all these emails get home and well what color hats do you like brian you're like i don't know just make me a black hat i'm gonna go snowboarding more don't bug me and then they send you like well which color of black should we go with the charcoal black the brown black <laughs> it's just like dude you gotta leave me alone yeah so that was a big turn off all that stuff i still am not good at it still i think of like starting a business like Whatever it may be, and I'm like, I don't know if I can handle it. It's a lot of extra work. Uh-huh. I would need a wonderful girlfriend that would want to do all that stuff and do it with her. I'd need a buddy to do it with, yeah. Yeah, you need the yin and yang. Yeah. You know, you can bring X to the table and she can bring Y. Yeah. But, I mean, I'm, yeah, and I moved to the city thinking, oh, I'll ride the local mountains, I'll come up to Whistler on the weekend, I'll keep the snowboard passion alive but that never really happened i was like oh not i'm not going to the local mountains in van and coming up to whistler on the weekends really hard it's busy i don't know what the conditions are like you know and it's like you go riding and it takes you half the day to figure out the snow conditions before you can start like actually ripping you know whereas you're there every day you're like you can go up you know the side hits you know know, it's a little bit windy last night we can go here you know, or whatever, all that stuff. Yeah, the side hits. So what about like when Dope started really taking off? Because I know that like those homies were really inspired by you. You're close with all those dudes. Dope starts taking off. At that point, you kind of already have moved away. When that kind of thing exploded and stuff, was that something that you were like kind of bummed you weren't a part of? Or were you just like... Uh, yeah, I, w- I, was, I always wanted to be a part of it. I mean, you were. More. Brockle would always include you as much as he could. I yeah, remember, yeah, like, yeah. you know, all in demand skis and stuff yeah. like that. Like, and he would always be like, I think we're going to go and film with Brian or, like, try to get w- at you. I wish I had filmed the legit part with that. That would have been, the, that been great. That would have been, like, a way to film the part I w- always wanted to film. I, kept, I feel like I've never filmed the full part. I feel like that. Your talent was so insane, but given the right opportunity, and like you said, like these little brands weren't like, you know, if they actually followed through with paying you and giving you opportunity, that would have been a really easy thing to fulfill. I also, like child support to me was a no-brainer. Like you're so talented, so ahead of the time, like give this guy some money to film a full part. And the fact that that didn't happen is like, you know, it shows, it shows poli- all the politics and snowboarding well. Brian's the most talented, but this guy is a lot more, you know, you know, he's the hero that. and we need him yeah. in there. Yeah. But I, yeah, I got, I mean, or then maybe I would have stayed and then different stuff would have happened in my life. I went and did other things and more life experiences. 
Everything happens. For everything happens. Everything happens for a reason. You have to believe that because I mean, like you, you don't know if you would have rode for another year and then you know a car would have hit you right across the street after you landed a back nose press on a triple kink. Exactly. I mean, the clip would have been sick, but you would have died. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So someone saw that happening and got me out of there. Do you do you love it more than ever? Or is it still one of those things that you're like, oh, that was fun. That was a fun time in my life. But like, I'm excited for like new things. I know. I know. I love it more than ever still. This year was the first year I didn't go because I couldn't with the hip. Uh, and the year before, I went once, but it was like I went with my nephew just to go with him. And I was like two runs in. I'm like, my hip hurts. We got to go kind of thing. But I know in my head that I love it so much. And I want to do, I want to live at a ski hill again. I want to do more seasons in my life. What about Mount Kane? If you're going to live near the island or whatever Mount like that. Mount Kane. Have you heard of Mount King? It. It's on the it's on Vancouver Island. Vancouver. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure. Like I I think ideally I would do whatever ten months of the year and then move to a hill for two months and not work and just shred for two months at a hill. That's what I would that's what I want to set myself up doing for the rest of my life. That sounds like a perfect that sounds like the balance yeah, the that balance. you need. And then you moved to Vancouver. Did you like that life in Van or was it like I liked it. Um, having skate parks finally at your fingertips was the first for me. Like, there were skate parks everywhere down there, and you could skate. That was great. I didn't like the traffic and the rent, so I moved into the van almost right away and spent mo- almost all the time in the city in a van and working for Graydon. He'd start a framing company in the city. He moved there, you know, a couple of years before us. Started a framing company. When I moved to the city, I I uh, started working for him because painting wasn't fun. I painted up here with Dave Dolly for years, as many of us did for Paramount Painting. I painted for everyone I know that lived in Whistler, painted for Dave. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Shout out, Dave. He kept it like, what a G. Yeah. I'd love, like, that's a great guy. Double D. He's also like, he was kind of like a, he was a sponsored snowboarder. He's- Shredding. He's got shots in old videos. I yeah. Think he's got shots in sled neck videos too. Yeah, he was a sled neck snowboarder, really good skater, a bowl skater. Rich Carlson, yeah. who still works yeah. there, is another like sledder, skateboarder. Still there, guy. Rich Carlson. That was, and that's amazing. Painting up here in Whistler, you're outside with the bros. You don't seem like you need a lot to be like really happy. Every time mm-hmm. I, I mean, I worked with you for a half summer with Russell Dalby. I remember Russell and I would always joke, like, you could give Brian a job, like, shovel a pile of sand into this pail, and you'd never see somebody so, like, sure. And, I'm, and I can't believe how much I learned from that short period of time working with you guys, bricklaying. It was like, st- for the rest of my life, still now, I'm going, oh, yeah, I know what to do here because of the bricklaying, like... We're, I don't know, just like leveling the ground, getting stuff packed right. Like if you're placing rocks, you like throw some That's funny you down there that. and shit. And it's like, like every job is like that, but most jobs I've had for a long time. So you like learn stuff that are life lessons and keep coming up. But that was like, I didn't work there very long. No, I think you lived there, like, for, worked there for like a month, maybe two. Yeah. Yeah, a month or something, I think. Or maybe even less, like a couple of paychecks. And then it was like, <laughs> I just remember being so psyched much. that I was working with Brian McClatchy. I was like, yes. Yeah, so then I'm working in the city for Graydon Freeman. Living on the site, skateboarding. But just kind of came too much at one point, too much city. And then I moved to Salt Spring one summer. for Salt the summer. Spring Island? Yeah, Salt Spring Island. Moved on a farm there that's like a guy had bought like 50 acres and he's trying to build up a little commune kind of. It was fun, but a lot of it was hard. Felt like you're taking care of people a lot. Like it was just a bunch of freaking hippie. hippies. So you, like, but like, what would a day <laughs> like be like on heart. this Salt Spring Island commune? I've been to Salt Spring. It's very, you know, by donation. Like, please help yourself to some of these flowers, and you drive down the road, and it's like leave what you think is a fair amount for these tomatoes and carrots, and you drive down the road, and there's a bunch of eggs, and it would just say like by donation, like leave a respectable amount or whatever like that with yeah, a heart, and, yeah. which is adorable. This island, I was like, whoa, they, they got it going on here. Yeah, it's pretty neat. You put that shit in the city, someone's going to be like, free eggs, free bouquet of flowers. 
Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, theft for me is a hard one. People stealing from each other is fucking devastating for me. When I get robbed, it's awful. So don't steal. No. If you steal, you're going to lose your friends. And if you lose your friends, you ain't got shit. Yeah. Going to Shambla, me and E-Man bought, bought a phony ticket. You and E-Man bought phony tickets to Shambla? One, one phony ticket, luckily only one. And then we, yeah, it was just like a scam on the internet. Like we didn't get a ticket. I paid the guy. So you and E-Man laced up to go to a music festival, Shambla. Shambla? I don't even know how to say it. I've never been before. My buddy Dustin, Dustin Craven, goes all the time. I don't think he's missed one. Cody Wilson goes. So Yeah, we went with... Uh, we went with Keenan, the three of us, me, me Keenan, and uh, E-Man. And Keenan then, Filmer, shout yeah. outs. We were at Camp Graderade. Camp Graderade? Yeah. Oh, with Grady. Grady and Harry, our partner, and uh, a bunch of Aussies, like Lucy, Erica. Anyway, it was, it was a fucking blast. What, what? But yeah, Keenan has been for nine years, the last nine years. Wow. I think, so what does this music festival Grady. bring to you? Like... This is the first time I went. So with my injury, but going back to my injury, I have all of, all of a sudden two years, no snowboarding, no skateboarding, next to no girl attention, um, no festivals, all, all bit huge parts of my life. And the festivals is like one of the biggest parts of my life. Everyone finally takes care of each other and everyone is aware and on the same page and is loving and stuff. It's like, I need that so bad in my life to see that. And so I was just like crippled and not able to do any of these things. So I went to Base Coast, realized, oh yeah, this shit is so good. Like it's so healthy and, you know, you see the music and the arts and stuff, but it's mainly just the connection it's like the connections with the people that brings me this joy and happiness that i need i mean i just went, got back from oceaga and it's the same thing i mean like day two you're there you're having some drinks and it's just like the good times are flowing and by the end, by the middle of it it's like you drop into a different mindset and it's no yeah. longer like no one gives a shit what you do. No one cares if you're the rich guy that has an Audi or the exactly. guy who lives in a van with his dog. And then this magic starts happening there. Like the most magic I see is at the festivals. Like that's that's what really like I always believe. You mean between humans and stuff like that, like acts of kindness and stuff, or what do you mean? Like, like you wanting something. Like oh, I wanna. I want a new pair of shades. Like, I want a pair of shades with better reflective shit. And then a complete stranger just walks up to you and doesn't even say anything and just puts these perfect re reflective shades on that you were just, like, thinking about how much you want it. <laughs> you know? And then it's like, that ain't no coincidence. Something's going on here, you know? <laughs> or just, like... Yeah, just... It's just too... It's just too real to ignore. So you had an amazing time with E-Man there. Yeah, yeah. So, so I went to Base Coast and said, oh yeah, this is what's up, the festivals I was forgetting. And then... Well, you need yeah, to find those little I, things. I've been kind of like, not that close with E-Man the last few years. Like, I'm in the city, he's up here. And, well, I've been on the island now in the last three years, not even in the city. So even less contact with people. And E Man's doing his thing up here. So we're not, we're like, not that we're not tight, but we're not like hanging out at all. So I was like, I I was kind of surprised that he wanted to go to I mean, Shambhala. like, you know, you remember growing up with Eve. Yeah. Like, Eve's like pretty anti festival, anti yeah. that world. So, and now it's just like, you know, he's a little bit more open. Yeah. And that, so I was like, fuck, man, I have to go to this festival with E-Man and reconnect with them. And sure enough, it happened. Like, we had, we had so many good hangouts. Like, so many bro-downs. And just feel open with each other. More than we ever have before in our life. Like, way more than we were as kids or anything. That's, a, like, when you have that <coughs> with somebody and you have that meaningful 
conversation. And I mean, sometimes it does take a few drinks or whatever to get to that. But sometimes those are the best conversations Mm -hmm. you ever get to. Like my dad, like somebody that I'm not really that open with, but I have a few drinks with him. And it's kind of nice to say some real shit on like a a level. Yeah, it's like a substance had to take you to to get to that, some beers or whatever. But like there that you say that stuff and it's like some of the realest shit you've ever said. That's another thing I kind of wanted to talk about is I feel like drugs might be the solution to save the world. <laughs> but we've been, we all have an urge. I feel we all have an urge to take drugs or get fucked up. But we've been raised in this society where it's like, here's some shitty cocaine, here's some fucking booze, and here's, like, gnarly drugs, like, gnarly prescription drugs, gnarly stuff, and it's like, we're just taking the wrong drugs. Yeah, I know. Or you could smoke some weed, maybe eat some mushrooms, some psilocybin, yeah. and their, the effects take, of that. Take some microdose, or take some full-on, like, ayahuasca or peyote retreats, and this sort of stuff, and... Yeah, I have a lot of friends right now that are going south to do peyote and ayahuasca. I don't personally feel like that's what I need, but I do know a lot of people feel like they have um, they have a void or something. And maybe one day I will. Like people go through life, and one time I feel like there's different like points in your life, and sometimes people hit that point early in life. Like I I'm empty. I don't know what I need, but I need something. But some people go through their whole life, and then boom, at 75, they're like. I, what is this? Like that whole drug, ayahuasca, DMT, that stuff. I mean, Joe Rogan talks about it all the time, but it's kind of like there's a huge amount of, I don't want to say fulfillment, but like there's a connection and it brings you back and it grounds you and it gets rid of those like demons and those anxieties and those like things that you judge yourself Te- for. And they kind of just stuff about yourself and yeah. the world. Yeah. And it's like the answer might be these things that have been inside of cultures like Mayan cultures and rituals that we've been doing these psilocybin kind of DMT retreats for the, since the beginning of time. Yeah. I feel like we, I feel like we can save the world with that because it's the best way to teach us the knowledge we need to know and the quickest, most effective way of showing people the light. If you can say that. And I'm not sitting here on the podcast trying to sell you guys like, Go out there and do much. Like, if it's not your thing and you're not looking for it, don't do it. We're just kind of preaching that there's certain drugs you should maybe stay away from. There's certain drugs that if you're looking for something and you do your research, maybe in a microdose kind of setting, they could actually help you. I mean, and do it, your homework. Yeah, and dif- different for everyone. Like, everybody's different. Source yeah, it no, out. There's some people who shouldn't even smoke weed. And trust your instinct and trust your feelings and wait for the right time. Like we said, do your thing. I, I'm a big fan of alcohol, and I, but not for me. I know I don't. I can't drink. Yeah, because you know yourself. I know it's not yourself. for me, but I see, I see lots of, lots of good things in it. Lots of bad, and I hate how the government is controlling that, and they chose that one to be legal and nicotine to be legal. It's pretty fucked up to me, but yeah, and like you said, we're on, the only reason why we're so open with alcohol and nicotine and why we're so against or we're so against cannabis and psilocybin and stuff like that is because that's what you're taught it's just like the gasoline motor be- motor vehicles whereas like the ford brothers had a hemp car running off hemp oil and it was harder than any steel and they exed it because they were like, there's no money. We're not going to make money. If we sell gasoline cars, then that's where the money's in, and that's the way they go. And now we're like living in a pretty fucked up world, stuck with the cars, polluting the shit. It was like, all, from, all for a few rich people who are already so rich for quick, to be richer. For a decision back then, yeah. And same with the trains. Like, We started building trains here. Why did we stop? Well, because humans... It always go to the easiest solution yeah so it's like well why do we like plastic it's like we have other alternative methods to cover a bowl that has your leftover noodles in it 
but nobody wants to use them because they don't stick as good and the plastic's just easier. It's like as soon as you realize that those simple solutions aren't or aren't the best solutions, that's when we're going to go in a better direction. You hear about the mushroom plastic? Mushroom plastic? Yeah. It works better or what? They're uh, making a plastic substance out of, I don't know if it's out of mycelium or mushroom. Hey, what mush? What what can't but, mushrooms do? But they're, they're, it's pretty. I think it's a pretty new thing, and they're they got a new plastic. Wow, it's like per- perfect and not like bad for the world. You guys hear that? Mushroom plastic by Brian McClatchy. He's gonna be a billionaire. You should make that, dude. You should patent that. You should make sure that they're doing that. And if they're not doing that, you should look into that. I want to make fanny packs out of mushrooms. Not necessarily out of mushrooms, but just fanny packs for festivals. And you got all your shit in one little thing. Because <laughs> there's, I was noticing at the vendors, no one's selling the fanny pack yet. Brian McClatch is and coming had, out with a... Dude, you we should were, do it. We were already decking ours out. Like, we were putting lights in there so you could see what's going on. Dude, you I and E-Man should start a company it. and it should be a fanny pack. If you and E-Man started a fanny pack company, you guys could actually do something with it. I mean, you know, Robert Kiyosaki, multi-millionaire real estate guy, started from a Velcro wallet. So, I mean, who knows? Maybe you start a fanny pack. Before you guys know it, you're hanging out with Elon Musk. And you guys could save the world. McClatchy, E-Man, Musk. I had a friend hanging out with Elon Musk a couple, a few nights ago, or like a week ago. <laughs> what? My friend Maddie was at a party and... He was there, and they start. They talk for like two hours, shooting the shit. Just the two of them. What? Elon so, seems like I'm, I'm like the dead. biggest fan, but I know it's crazy. Like, yeah, but he's just a regular old dude going to parties still, with even with all this shit on his plate. It's absolutely wild. It's like him smoking weed on the Joe Rogan show. He it was. just goes to show. Have, did you see that? I don't think I did. Okay, well, Elon Musk. Did a podcast with Joe Rogan. Yeah. He talks about AI and all this insane stuff. Yeah. His voice is kind of daunting in the podcast. But he also smokes a joint on the podcast. And of course, being the CEO of Tesla at the time, the, the share price dropped like 10%. Or I actually forget. Someone's listening to this probably actually knows. But it dropped quite significantly because there's so many anti-dopers, obviously. Yeah. And it just goes to show you know, Elon's like, I don't give a shit. Like, <laughs> I kind of liked it. I mean, I own Tesla stock too. And I'm like beyond happy that my CEO who started this forward thinking company is smoking cannabis in in front of people. How is cannabis, how is smoking a joint on a podcast not as, or on the same wavelength as having a beer? Mm -hmm. Like if someone's having a beer on a podcast, everyone's like, Oh, that's chill. You're smoking a joint. There's still that old fashioned mentality. That's like, that's the devil's lettuce. That shit's going to change your genes. It's like, (laughs) just because people have been drinking alcohol forever, and they haven't been open to the whole idea of like cannabis doesn't mean that it's bad for you. Yeah, you can even just meditate yourself into a state of highness or I heard about that. Um, you can meditate like to breath- a point of hallucinating. Like breathing exercises, you can go full on in there. There you go. The you other, don't need anything. The other side. Uh, yeah. So what's in store for Brian? What's the future looking for like? It seems like you're you came back from this festival, your hips starting to feel better. Are you uh, like you got to be excited to move forward now. Like yeah. you got like burned kind of in the past with that stupid hip thing. You're going out tonight with two girls, so maybe something. Maybe you'll meet a connection there. Yeah. And then you these got. You're like, going to snowboard like this sis- year or what? These are like my sisters. When I moved to the city, I met a really good group of girls, and they're just like. They bring so much happiness into my life. Where am I going with this? Oh, uh, yeah. So me and Steve work for Lady Nancy. I think I was saying this. And it's just amazing. She's amazing. Like, I've realized in my life I need, to, if I'm working for someone, I need full respect of them and from them to me. And I need to be down for the cause. Like, I can't just work for any old random company or random person. Yeah, you like to and have a great, level. Great is like that. Dave Dolling is like that. Mongoli Grill is basically like that. So I kind of fell in a lot of lucky jobs over my life and realized that's so important. And then It needs to be a two-way streak. I feel like the, an old mentality is to be a boss and to 
feel superior to the people that you're hiring to work for your business. It's a two-way street. And like you said, you need to show them respect and they need to show you the exact same amount. And you, if you guys click and stuff like that, that's where, that's where magic, that's really where magic happens when it comes to any business. If, if you like working for your boss and your boss is happy to have you as an employee because you're showing up on time and doing, you know, you still got to be a good employee. That's when people like, then you actually feel you get to work and then you talk to Dave Dowling in the morning, the paint boss or whatever, and you shoot the shit and you're like, hell yeah, I'm going to get that fascia done today. You're the man. But if he shows up and yells at you and he's grumpy and stuff, it's like, where's the, like, I don't want to work hard for this guy. This guy's a piece of shit. Or if you see him being mean to people. Yeah, like with Graven, I don't even think, I worked for him for probably five or six years. I don't even think I ever kept track of my hours once. I just kind of would, he would give me a paycheck, a random amount of hours, probably more than I worked, maybe less, but probably more. It's just the best. There's like no sense of being screwed or like, yeah, it was just perfect. And then Nancy, Nancy's the same. Like I've worked for her last summer and this summer and I like love her. I love her family. I love helping them out. She treats us really well. Um, so I kind of want to, the work is so good there that I want to stay. We're not on waterfront on our property. She is where we're working, but where we live, we aren't. And it's not our property. So I want to get our hands on a property on the water, one in particular. So I want to keep that going. I want to get more into artistic things, I guess, or like more crafty things or more custom things or like... Yeah, explore your artistic side. Yeah. Um, I feel like my girlfriend, she's not very... She doesn't try to be artistic, but she does set a certain amount of time aside to like dabble in those things. And whenever yeah. she's done with it, I'm always amazed by what she's accomplished or what she's done. I'm always like, you are artistic. But if you never explore that, yeah, that's not, it's not a good thing. If you aren't doing anything artistic, you really should. Like whether it's drawing, skateboarding, you have to find something where you have a creative outlet. I feel like that's so healthy for all humans. Like some way to release, because everybody is creative you don't have to be as creative as dolly and picasso and brian mcclatchy and actually at shambhala i tried a virtual reality kind of thing was it dope it was insane like you put the goggles on that are like really comfy and look expensive you you can see three 360 degrees everywhere is something like it's not a real world in this one it's like a trippy laser laser show kind of but you can see the remotes and you pick them up and they got joysticks, spinny buttons and thumb buttons that change the shapes and lasers that you're shooting. And you have like this full control of it was, it was fucked up. I didn't know the technology was like that. Yeah. Like uh, Elon said, technology is learning now at an infinite rate because you don't have to solve anything anymore. Math problems or anything like that, like robots can do all of those problems. You don't need mathematicians anymore. I'm sure someone, maybe there's one mathematician listening to this podcast and he's like, we serve a purpose, but like there is no like numeric amount of numbers that a computer can't solve or, or anything anymore, you know? Yeah. We've opened Pandora's box and the future is gonna be crazy. Super crazy. Super yeah, crazy. We, yeah, we're living in a, awesome generation it is it's I was kind insane of, i was bitter i think when i was younger i was like fuck i'm too late i should have been here like i always dreamed i always wanted to be native north american before white man arrived that was that's my ideal situation to be in but just canoeing more, hunting yeah exactly fishing but just more more and more i'm going holy fuck we're in the fucking thick of it Oh yeah, we're, we're gonna, gonna see. We're the, gonna see the shit. We're gonna happens. see. Yeah, I feel like we're gonna see aliens. It's gonna be. We're gonna if we haven't already. I mean, I don't know if you've seen that petition that's on Facebook, September twenty first. All the people that are going to Area fifty one to bombard it to see what's in it. Right now, there's I'm pretty Ooh, sure yeah. over a million people from all over the world on this Facebook thing that are gonna go oh, yeah. and charge Area fifty one. I don't know if you've seen that on Facebook, but it's it. actually insane. There's like. I think because, there's 500,000 people. Because of this people. Bob Lazar's 
documentary me? because of Bob Lazar's documentary? I don't know. I think people are just I the people outside of Area. This is what I've heard. The people outside of Area Fifty One have seen too many suspicious things happening around there, that they started a Facebook go, uh, a Facebook um, page. I think it was more of a joke at the beginning, like let's all go to Area Fifty One. They can't stop us all. Kind of movement. Yeah. And it just turned. It just went viral. Wow. And I'm pretty sure within like a month, 500,000 people said they're going. And I read all the comments. Well, not all of them. Obviously, there's hundreds of thousands of them. But there's people like, we're going. We're taking the fences down. They can't stop us all. And then there's 500,000 pending people. There's people all the way from like being really serious about it. Like, we need to be armed in case there's aliens and stuff. And there's people that are like, we should go there and smoke weed and see what's up. It'll be crazy. Like it's going to be whatever. Uh, Even if great. 10% of those people or 5% of those people, 50,000 people show up either way, it's going to be on the news. South Park's going to make an episode on it and it's going to be fucking awesome. That's amazing. I, I didn't know about that. So maybe if you're, I don't know if it's exactly September 21st, uh, maybe check the dates on Facebook um and let brian know maybe brian will go maybe he has some spare time i will not be attending because i don't want to be the first to see the aliens you know i got a red flag to go to the states but oh, i you guess you can just sneak around the <laughs> why do you have a red flag oh uh, um one way or another they caught on to me being down there working in the dope scene <laughs> a friend tried a friend tried to cross um didn't delete the text messages and they grinded them to tell tell who I was and what they were going to do. Busted for harvesting a plant. Busted, but and again, blessing in disguise. Yeah, because it's pretty lawless down there and reckless and wild, and maybe it's best that I had fun and don't go back. I know I've heard um I've heard some from some friends in in Winnipeg who were down there that. They know some people that disappeared and stuff like that, that work at those things. So maybe, you know, you're in, you're out. I mean, if it wasn't fully legal, I mean, like that shit's suspect. Now it it is like the farm I work for got, you know, they, they're in the process of going legal. So things are, everything's changing. Um, You know, they got a letter saying stop growing or whatever. For sure. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad I got down there while it was going on. Heck yeah. There's a mur- pr- pretty good documentary on it, Murder Mountain. I know. Yeah. It's, it's pretty uh, pretty accurate. Like, that was right in the area where I was. All their poetry. I've heard all about it. And uh, I haven't seen it yet. That's on my uh, to-do list. Maybe I'll watch it tonight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what's, so... What's the future? So we're on Gambier, and we want waterfront. So we're going to try and get our own property waterfront with a dock. The one we want is three hundred grand. Maybe we can get the lady we work for to help us out. Co- or co-sign. you could call your old friend Matt Belzel, who's a real estate guru, and maybe he'll see it as a good investment and he'll buy it with you. <laughs> yeah. Matt's in the real estate game pretty hot these days. I'll call him. You should. I'm sure he'd sure. be happy yeah, to. Cause, yeah, I'm, I'm at the point where it's like, I don't like asking for stuff like that. I've never asked for for help or this or that from people, but now I'm going... Oh, you got to, you got to ha- ask for help. That's like you, one you of the most, help whether it's helped. help for, you know, from your friends to help you cut a table to like knowing when to reach out when you're like in an unhealthy place mentally. I mean like, yeah, yeah, and, na- exactly. and nowadays it's like, that's such a important thing to know yeah. male and female that we all go through tough times. And if you're depressed or whatever, the last thing you should do is ever think that like you shouldn't reach out to people. Yeah. Whether it's that or even asking for help from Belzil to know if it that's a good investment. I mean, like, mm-hmm. those people come in your life and they go, and just because you don't see them all the time doesn't mean that they stopped caring about you. And, I mean, if he doesn't email you, hit you back or whatever, then he's a piece of shit and he's a write-off. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't that important after all. Matt Belzil is a legend. Holy yeah, he's been getting it. Who's some uh, who's some boarders that you've been liking, like following? I mean, you probably don't follow the snowboard scene at like that uh, you did, but like no, I don't. You know, I try to follow the skate scene a bit, but uh, any skaters you like these days? Oh yeah, Cater. Uh, at Et. 
Yeah, Cater is great. Um, you know that Echen kid from Montreal? Mm-hmm. His name's Et. I don't know. He's I don't sure. know, he skates for Vans. He's just I just know him because he skates for Vans and he's homies with some of my homies. And I mean that kid's yeah. got six. I really like his D. That is something mind boggling is the level of skate of skateboarding, especially it's, it's, the street skateboarding. I mean all of it, but it hurts my the head. The progression sometimes. level escalate at one point, maybe I don't know, five years ago. I think when Ardo or sorry backlit that kink, it just kind of started going through. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember that clip? Yeah, the it's like high mellow. Yeah, high mellow king. Just like hits it so good at the it's middle, insane. like it looks like he should hook <laughs> or something, and he just pushes through it. Yeah. Any shout outs? Anybody you want to say thanks to? Oh yeah, shout outs. I mean, Jared, I was having a baby, so that's pretty rad. Jared, I and Crystal. He's he's a big he's a big part of my whole life, West Coast life, Jared. Al. Um, yeah shout out to Jay he's shot in photos of all everyone who's lived in Whistler uh-huh. and just a homie uh, yeah my yeah my family huge huge re- realizing that yeah like hanging out with my brothers is pretty rad and special and I don't do it enough I know They're I back go home now back. yeah like I've got a nephew that's one and I haven't met him yet so I'll have to go home here pretty soon in the fall and do that. Um, yeah, I think we can, I think we can, I want to say we can control stuff with our mind, so we got to start practicing that. And that's maybe how we can save the world. Pan- uh, the power of manifestation. Manifestation. And power of positivity. Positivity. I feel like we can control the weather and everything with it. Well, there you go, guys. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think I'm a little bit more logical and I don't think we can, but I mean, I'm just saying that for argument's sake, but I like that you think we can. What do you think? I'm just looking at my notes to see if there's any other stuff I want to say. I was never down with the school system. (laughs) That, That had a negative effect on my life and like caused me to like fucking rebel, I think, so much. I mean, the school system is so ancient. It's really set us all up to work as if we were inside of like an industrial building making tools and cars. Like we're just, that's how the school system's structured. There's not a lot of creativity if you don't learn the same way as somebody. Now they're starting to learn that there's tons of different ways to learn and to excel. And that just because that kid's not good at English or math doesn't mean they're good. Like I almost was taught that like, good luck in life, buddy because you weren't the best at school. Like I wasn't terrible, but like my teachers were definitely being like, you need to try they, harder or life. They probably basically tough. said that to you too. Like that, like good luck. Yeah, totally. Yeah. They were like, good luck, Jody. You're going to, and I mean like it's been 12 years out of high school and I got to say, I think I'm having a pretty good time. Yeah. And that's really you're all always that's in matters good spirits. What did school do to you? Did it, did, were they like, Brian, you're not learning fast enough. You need to know when Christopher Columbus got here. Oh, we got our dates wrong. Yeah. He actually didn't get here first. Yeah. It was yeah, the Vikings. All that stuff. And it's almost like we were kids and we were more intuitive. So we knew in the back of our minds that you guys aren't telling us the truth or you don't even believe that or, you know, you could tell maybe by the tone of their voice or something that like shit was off and like, they're telling you, don't do this, don't do that. And it's like, deep down inside, we knew what was best for us, you know? And maybe subconsciously, I was just, it was messing with me or something. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's <laughs> tight. Know, but yeah, we could, we could end it on that. Yeah, I, I, had a, I, had a, I had a funny time in the school system. Loved it. I mean, high school's great and everything, but... Yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah, Jody. Uh, think, thanks I'm, for having me. Got to say, I love being around you, and when I see it, it's always, it's always a treat. And uh, yeah, your snowboarding was one of the best. To, you were maybe one of the best to ever do it. I mean, did you fully? You didn't even see where it could go. Yeah. I mean, you got to be yeah. the best, and then you were like, ah, this shit's too easy, peace. <laughs> mm-hmm. What's impressive is some guys are still doing it that we were watching 
growing up in the videos. Like, it's fucked up. Like Nicholas Mueller is still snowboarding. Devin Walsh is still snowboarding. Even if it's not professionally, they're, you know, Browner and Kayla are going sledding. Like, they're getting it. It's just like, wow. Yeah. You guys are rad. Yeah, Browner. I mean, I was, I was doing side, like, hit runs this year with JF, Devin, Browner, Dion, DeLaSalle, like that whole crew, they still just love snowboarding. And it's, I mean, it's a cool little community imagine, we have here. Imagine people, to think that 10 you, or so years ago, 12 years ago, that you'd be hitting those side hits with those boys. Too. I know, right? I remember going to it's pretty neat. Longhorn and seeing all those wildcats and all those dudes. And now they're just friends and dads and unreal dudes. I got to get a lot of those guys on the podcast. But yeah. thanks so much for coming on, Brian. It's Thank been a you, treat. Baby. And uh, yeah, everybody. Oh, we're so so positive. Good man. Any any words of wisdom before we end this thing? Um, I would like to say some good words of wisdom, but I think I'm I think I'm speechless. You're speechless. Yeah. We can leave it at that. Um, Brian's speechless. Peace, everybody. Yeah. Drive safe. Be awesome. 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 Drive safe. Be awesome.